Well, thank you, Marisa. Good morning, um, friends and colleagues. Welcome to this next item on the agenda. Um, as Marisa said, I'm Teodoro Frank. I'm the director of the investigations of the Anti-Fraud Office of Catalonia. And as a moderator of this roundtable, I will, I will give you the few, the few simple basic guidelines for this roundtable. First, I'll do my best trying to summarize the extensive curricula of these gentlemen joining me in this table, all, all practicing lawyers in national, international level, and their curriculums more extended you have in the documents handed to you. Then, um, each of them, for 10 to 15 minutes, will share with us their views on, on a series of topics that I will introduce to you too. Um, and then, with your questions, uh, will most certainly entail a fruitful debate. Uh, this is not a formal format, so feel free and encouraged to ask your questions or your interest at any time uh, all along their, their, intervention, their interventions. Um, first of all, thank them beforehand, um, all of them, their involvement and their, and their active approach so for participating in this, in this project. And, and uh, for my part, I will start introducing them. First, to my right, is Mr. Alain Casanovas, partner of KPMG Legal Area since 2000, and who's held a position of secretary to the board of m various multinational companies, provided legal advice, and also appointed as an arbitrator by the uh, Arbitrary Court of Barcelona. He's listed in the Best Lawyers International Directory since 2012. And his more recent publications include um, the books International Legal Control, published in 2012, and Legal Compliance, General Accepted Principles of Compliance, published in 2013. Um, thanks for being with us. To my, to my left is uh, Ignacio Fustefabra, lawyer, coordinator of the litigation department in Fustefabra Abogados, dealing with both civil and criminal litigation. It must be underlined his experience in terrorism-related and white-collar criminal cases, and the fact that he provides legal advice to financial institutions regarding the criminal implications of the Spanish Money Laundering Act and for their regulations. Among his teaching experience, it's worth mentioning, too, that he's been master's professor of transnational corruption of money laundering in the Universidad Europea de Madrid, and appeared in several TV programs as an expert in criminal law. He will share with us uh, practical issues from the implementation of the probation plans and what's after the corporate compliance program, uh, what to do once a legal procedure has been initiated, and again, thank you very much for being with us to, to this morning. And last but not least, Carlos Gomez Jara, founding partner of Corporate Defense, practicing lawyer both in Spain and in the United States, European uh, Doctor in Law and United States Masters in Law. His work and of course, working in several cases in both jurisdictions, representing interests of individuals and legal entities, both private, from construction companies to banks, and publicly owned companies, uh, and publicly owned legal entities, such as the Spanish Deposit Insurance Fund or the Fund for Orderly Banking Restructuring. He's included in Best Lawyers International Legal Directory too, listed as an expert in criminal law. His most recent publications include Treaties on Corporate Criminal Liability, published in 2012, and European Criminal Federal Law, published in 2014. From my perspective, as Investigations uh, Department Director of the Antifraud Office of Catalonia, which, is, which deals with uh, corruption in the public sector, he will address a very interesting issue, which is um, he will talk about corruption standards in, uh, public corruption standards for private corruption and focusing on corruption standards in private companies, the global perception of blameworthiness of private corruption practices, and also will point some recommendations for future actions coming from his experience. Also, thank you very much for being with us. And now I will give the floor to Alain Casanovas, who will um, uh, talk uh, about his experience in the, in the new um, ISO standards uh, re related to bribery, perfect link to my colleague's previous presentation when she talked about the ISO standards too. Gentlemen. Thank you very much. First of all, good morning. And I would like to thank the Oficina Antifraud de Catalunya, the invitation to participate in these sessions today. For me, it's a pleasure, not only a pleasure, but a privilege to be here with all of you 
sharing with you some thoughts and some news regarding international standards. Uh, for these purposes, I have prepared a presentation, a small presentation, just to go through in a few minutes. <coughs> regarding, uh, I would say, the, the most uh, relevant standards related with uh, anti-bribery or compliance in a wider sense, which are the ISO 19600 and the ISO 37, uh, 37-1000. Okay, my, the, president is, uh, the president's speech of Mark Cardona explained a little bit about these standards, these international standards. Both are quite new. I will explain uh, when these standards start and what was the, the origin of these standards. Uh, my colleague Carlos, that after all will, uh, will talk about it again, and myself, we know quite well these standards because we are participating in the Spanish working group uh, drafting this standard, and also we both represent the position of Spain regarding this standard at the ISO International Committees, in the ISO International Committees. So we know quite well both standards, and our aim, at least mine, is to provide you with a general overview of both. I will go through these few points. I have to say that the business environment of this century is significantly different that uh, that the past, that what happens in the past, I mean, the, the legal complexity of business env environment is quite, is increasing day, day by day. And this is a concern for companies because every day companies are obliged or are supposed to meet with more and more requirements. These, uh, some of these requirements, as you uh, can imagine, refers to uh, corruption or anti-bribery policies. But not only, uh, this is just a part of the requirements applicable to companies. Uh, in, technical <clears throat> in technical words, I would say that the compliance obligations of companies has increased in the last, in the last I would say, in the last uh, maybe five, ten years. Uh, what's a compliance obligation? Just to uh, provide you with a framework. A compliance obligation is a requirement or a commitment. This is something which is quite new because traditionally, a compliance obligation has been uh, assimilated to a requirement, not a commitment. And from a technical point of view, from an ISO perspective, compliance obligations are both uh, requirements and commitments. A requirement is something which is obliged by the law, by the law or by the regulations or the regulator. Uh, but a commitment is a, some sort of obligations that companies impose uh, voluntarily by themselves. They impose their own obligations. This is a this is a commitment. So when we're talking about compliance, compliance has to do with requirements and commitments. So just for those of you that maybe are not familiar with, with ISO, ISO is an international organization which is made of, of different national uh, normalization authorities. You know that in some countries, uh, the, 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 the government or the state give the opportunity to issue technical rules to certain normalization entities. For example, in the US is ANSI, or in Germany is DIN, you may know DIN is quite common for technical regulations of AFNOR in France, or in Spain in INOR. So when an ISO, there is an ISO initiative to provide or to make a rule about anything, first things they do is, is, is invitate, make an invitation to the different countries to participate in the preparation of this, of this standard. And this happens in the both standards I will talk about, the compliance standard and the anti-bribery management systems standard. So, as I mentioned in the beginning, I participate in the Spanish committee and also represent the Spanish committee or the Spanish position in the international standard regarding both compliance uh, rules, standards. Uh, why an ISO, an ISO uh, standard is relevant? It's relevant because two reasons, mainly from a te technical perspective. First of all, because it is understood as a framework. Technically speaking, a framework is a set of rules which are specific, which are very concrete, which provides requirements or guidelines, but very specific, easy to follow, are not just philosophical, but very specific things to do. This is a, what is technically called a framework, a complete framework. But furthermore, what is relevant for a framework is not only to be complete, but only be generally accepted. 
you may have a standard which is complete, but maybe it's not generally accepted. A compliance, and once again, technique speakily, is generally accepted when a lot of people have participated in the preparation of this standard and had the opportunity, the choice, to introduce amendments, to introduce comments, just to participate in the procedure. Here, in this slide, I just uh, show the, the procedure that uh, follows ISO International in the preparation of an international standard. And as you will see, there are different stages, and if in, in each stage, each country can provide comments, can provide suggestions, and so on. I forget to say that not only countries are invited to participate in this sort of international committees, but also, but also stakeholders as well. For example, in the case of the anti-bribery management systems, the OECD is participating, Transparency International is participating as well, a lot of stakeholders with interest in the topic. So, during this procedure, each of the participating countries and each of the stakeholders represented in the group can introduce amendments, make comments or suggestions or whatsoever. So at the end of the procedures you uh, have, or it's, it's end up with a framework which is generally accepted because it's not imposed, but let's say some sort of authority or is just accepted by everyone participating in the committee. You have to know that all the amendments or suggestions are introduced by consensus. So at the end of the day, when you get these sort of standards, you get a complete framework generally accepted by consensus. This is what te technically happens. Now, anticipating a little bit what I'm talking about in five minutes, a couple of minutes, the ISO 37 and 1000 is in the stage of committee draft. Here you can see the different stages from the first beginning as a proposal up to the publication of the standard. Now this one about uh, anti-bribery management systems, you know that bribery is a part of corruption, it's not full corruption, there are other ways of corruption, but bribery maybe is the more uh, significant one, uh, is in the stage of committee draft. I think it was two, two weeks ago that was uh, the last meeting, it was in Kuala Lumpur, but it's still being in committee draft uh, status. So after there are pending some discussions, the next discussion is going to take place in Mexico. So uh, we hope that in this discussion, maybe in a couple of sessions, uh, we will have a, maybe a final draft uh, of a standard. But let me spend some, some minutes talking, first of all, about the first standard about compliance. The first standard that appeared at the international level uh, about compliance was the ISO 19600. This standard is about compliance management systems. That is to say, it's a sort of framework, a specific framework providing guidance, guidelines for companies to set up for companies, public or private sectors. Not companies, maybe is not the correct word, for entities, organizations in the public and private sector uh, to have, let's say, internal systems for a uh, assure the compliance of the compliance obligations. Normally, as it happens in the past with other standards, when there is a normalization activity at international level, when there is an issue, initiative to create an international standard, normally you start with a local, with a national standard. This happens a lot of time. In the case, in the case of this ISO standard about compliance, uh, we took the Australian standard about compliance of uh, 2006. There was a very well-known standard. I mean, it was Australian. Australian, as most probably my colleague Carlos will explain, is one of the first countries introducing the corporate uh, culture approach to these sort of things. So this, this standard, 2000, uh, 2006, was introduced by Australian standards. And afterwards, in 2013, it was taken as a starting point to prepare uh, the compliance management systems standard of ISO International. But the content on the, uh, and the structure changed a little bit because here is a comparison between the structure of the Australian standard and the structure of the, of the ISO standard. And I have to, compare, to confess that the, the, the issue structure is better because it's more simplified. The Australian standard uh, starts with 12 uh, principles but in the case of the ISO standard are just six principles which are from uh, chapter four to ten. Anyhow, this standard is quite significant because why is this standard useful? 
for. It's useful for two, 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 two uh, goals. First of all, to have what is technically, technically called a compliance superstructure. I mentioned at the beginning that the complexity of compliance obligations, compliance requirements, and commitments of companies are higher and higher every year. So at the end of the day, you need coordinating companies the different compliance areas. One of the compliance areas may be criminal compliance, or if you want, uh, anti-corruption compliance, but it's not the only one. You have another. You have, for example, privacy compliance, competition compliance, tax compliance, labor compliance, environment compliance. You have a lot of them. So at the end of the day, it's a mess because if you don't coordinate these compliance areas, you multiplicate number of policies, procedures, and controls. And it is a mess for big companies. It is starting to be a big problem for big companies. I, I, let me just introduce a small a messages that the main concern of big companies, mainly quoted companies, is not the lack of procedures. It's the duplication of procedures and policies and controls. This is the problem big companies are, are facing nowadays. So. A superstructure of compliance allows companies to coordinate all the compliance fields or compliance uh, obligations, different compliance obligations of a company. But this standard is useful, but if you don't want to have, let's say, a superstructure of compliance because the complexity of the organizations don't need this sort of superstructure, then it's useful to create a compliance system for, us, for any specific area in which you don't have guidelines. For instance, if you don't have a specific guidelines for a, an anti-bribery uh, system in a given country, you can use this standard to create one and to follow these guidelines to have a robust uh, system, management system for avoiding criminal actions, uh, criminal behaviors, or bribery, so on. So it's a relevant standard. I would say that uh, ISO 19600 19, uh, is something that anyone dedicated to compliance uh, must know. Among other reasons, because this standard establishes the structure that will follow ISO rulings or ISO standards about compliance. I will talk in a few seconds about the anti-bribery management systems uh, ISO, and you will see and you will note that the index and the structure of this ISO rule is exactly the same as the one of this standard. So this standard uh, takes what is technically, technically called the high-level structure. The high-level structure of a management system, of a compliance management system, is a sort of basic structure that any compliance system has to meet. This is very good at international level because you know that there are different international standards about co compliance, if you want, local, not international, local compliance about uh, standards about compliance or anti-bribery. You know the requirements of the S FCPA, you know the requirements of the UK Bribery Act, you know some rulings that has been issued by the uh, local institutions. But uh, this is, once again, this is a mess for companies. And international companies cannot afford uh, to meet with the requirements of very different uh, compliance systems. It's difficult for them to meet uh, all of them at the same time. So what this standard is made of is for creating some sort of common framework at international level. And this is why OECD is very happy with this sort of initiative of having the same compliance systems worldwide. So if in the future you meet another company, you can see if the company is meeting a proper requirements at international level. So this is some, some additional information. I will not go through, through it. I have no time. It's just for, for your info. But a few words, finally, about the ISO 37001, which is an anti-bribery management uh, system. So a little bit afterwards, uh, starting the ISO 19600, uh, there was the initiative to create a specific uh, compliance system regarding focused on anti-bribery. This was the reason of creating the, uh, this, this ISO standard. I have to say that at the first beginning, there were some sort of discussions about the need to have this standard or not, because if you have in place the, the ISO 19600, why is the reason to have a specific standard regarding uh, anti-bribery management systems? And finally, it was agreed there was some sort of discussion. Some countries agreed to have it, or not, were not happy about it. But it finally, it was agreed. And uh, this uh, normalization initiative was, was agreed, and we start working on it. Just to provide some, some words of this, of this standard, which is 
which is being produced. I have to say that the ISO 19600 is already in place. It was approved at the end of last year, at the end of uh, last year, in December, I think it was, and, and now it's finished. And the only standard which is continuing uh, working on is working progress is this one. So the current status, as I mentioned before, is committee draft. The starting standard, as I mentioned at the beginning, the starting standard for the ISO 19600 was an Australian one. In this case of anti-bribery management system was a British one, was the British standard 10,500, which was an anti-bribery management system, um, let's say, that was issued a little bit afterwards the, the publication of the UK Anti-Bribery Act. Okay, so this, this is a starting point. It's a good starting point because, as you know, the difference between UK Bribery Act and FCPA from the US is that FCPA apply only to, let's say, public sector uh, corruption, uh, corruption to public, uh, to public officials. But the UK Anti-Bribery Act applies to public and private sector as well. So the starting point was very, very good in this, in this sense. The standard type if, uh, is a requirements standard. It's not a guidelines. You know, at international levels, if you are issuing a standard, you have to differentiate a guidelines standard. The ISO 19600 is a guidance and a requirement. When it's a requirement standard, it can be certificate. If it is a guidelines standard, it cannot be certificate. It's just a guideline, some sort of best practices and so on, but not certificable. In this case, it is to be uh, a requirements standard and this means that we'll be, able to, uh, we'll be able to be certificate. Any big company can be certi will be certificate, or could be certificate in the future if he wants to do it. The estimated uh, publication date is during the following year. We expect that if everything goes uh, properly, progress properly, maybe at the at summertime, more or less, we hope. And the essential content of this standard is mandatory compliance requirements and also some sort of guidelines. I, I have to say that part of this standard is really requirements, something that if you don't meet a company or an entity in the public or private sector doesn't meet with the requirement, cannot be certificate. This is a part of the standard, but apart of that, there is some sort of additional content in terms of some guidelines that if you have it, okay, and if you don't have it, you can be certificate if you have, let's say, the hard part of the standard. Coming back to the structure, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the structure of this standard is exactly the same that the structure and the index of the ISO 19600 because the aim of ISO International is, International is to have the same sort of a structure for all compliance standards, doesn't matter. Maybe if in the future there is a compliance standard about competition to say something, and I'm just, uh, I'm just thinking louder, it, this standard will follow the same structure. And everyone familiar with the 19600 will be easily, uh, will be for him, for her, easily to understand the new standard in the field, in whatever the field it is. So the structure is that, as you can see, coming from the context of the organizations to the improvement, these are the six requirements or the six components or big principles of this standard. And these principles are spread in different best practices. So uh, ending a little bit my presentation, the scope of the standard is the public and private bribery systems to prevent detect and manage eventual bribery behaviors, both in the public and the private sector. Is, uh, it is not needed to have a broader, let's say, compliance management systems. If you have a compliance superstructure is perfect, but if you don't have it, you may have an anti-bribery management system independently. It's no problem at all. Uh, well, let me see, there are a hard content and a soft content, as I mentioned at the beginning. There is the need of have some sort of body, a, an oversight body to take care of the system and to manage the system and take a, all the action regarding to the system, including training, a, you know, all the things which I think my, uh, Mark commented before. And this is standard at the same of the 19600 follow a risk-based approach. This is quite common, let's say, in, in advanced international standards. It's a risk-based approach. You have to identify the risks, and then when you have to identify the risks, you have to focus the systems on the risks 
Yeah, and um, the second second objectives are are are, are not uh, relevant for for this standard. You just follow where your risk, your bribery risk is. And finally, one uh, good thing regarding this standard is that uh, establish some sort of taxonomy of payments which are somehow related with bribery. This doesn't mean that these sort of payments are forbidden. Uh, what uh, I'm trying to say that this sort of payments is the common way in which bribery is committed. I mean, someone committed bribery doesn't call it bribery <laughs> directly, of course. And normally it's not committed directly, this is an, an, another true. So the way of commission of bribery normally is in the way of gift, of donations, of uh, travels, of sponsorships. And the good thing of this standard is that it is an update of the taxonomy of conflictive payments. It is not just a question of taxonomy, it is a question of taxonomy and submit this sort of payments to specific procedures. It doesn't mean that these payments are forbidden, as I mentioned before. It means that you have to submit this sort of payments to specific controls. If you don't have it, you are exposed to risk because then maybe there is some sort of bribery through, I don't know, training costs, for example. You may be paying training to your clients or to public officials, and this is, at the end, a uh, sort of bribery. There are some training which is very costly for organizations, as you know. So that's all. I, I think that, as, as it is a debate afterwards, I would finish here, and if there's any other question, I would leave it at, at the end. So thank you very much, all of you, and your disposal if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alain. Now, Ignacio has the floor. Thank you very much. Sorry, we have a problem with the sound, maybe. So, thank you very much. Uh, I, I told that, thank you very much to, to the anti-fraud office about the, the special meeting about corruptions. We are very glad to be here because we want to talk about uh, another vision for the, for the lawyers about the corporate compliance. And is that what happens about uh, the, when the corporate compliance program is being introduced in the company, what happens while, when the injure or the, or the crime is being committed for the, for the company? Um, the litigation lawyer, we are the, the bad girls of the university. Why? Because uh, usually in the company, and in this case, United States teach us so much about this, uh, we know that in the managing department of the companies, uh, they usually stay the lawyer of corporate lawyer, the tax lawyer, and what happens about the litigation lawyer? Because when we get it, a real problem, we need a litigation lawyer, a special, crime, uh, a special corporate compliance lawyer specialized in litigation. That's our case because our kind of vision of corporate compliance starts 30 years ago with our senior of council partner, Mr. Jose Maria Fustafara, who's today in this, in this meeting today. And the first questions that we, that we found is, uh, is there life after the corporate compliance program? What happens in the court? This is the, the, the questions that we got it, and there are a few paradigms during the professional life of, of, uh, of a lawyer, of us. Being one of them, the moment where the legal provisions, applicable regulations, law itself must be enforced and applied in real life. This is really important because, um, for example, in this case, uh, the lawyers of corporate compliance, we can compare, for example, uh, like in the army. I think that, for example, our, our partners who, who work in, in this case in the company about the corporate compliance uh, advisors are like the officer. The prosecutors, for example, in, in Spain could be like a military police, but what happens with the litigation lawyers? We are the Navy SEALs. We are the last chance, the last uh, opportunity of the company just to find the solution. And this is really important because we got the theory, we got the corporate compliance, but we have to introduce this corporate compliance program 
into the court, into the proceeding. And it's really important just to speak the same language like the court, like the judge. And it's really, really, really important. Um, I usually use uh, uh, basic principles. In that case, you know, for my students, when I, when I uh, teach in the university for my pupils, I talk to, to them that um, when we're talking about the law, um, we're talking about the, the soul science where one plus one does not equal two. And this is true. This is the real problem that we got, it, for example, in Spain. We, we don't have exactly results of the proceed because it's really different one proceed than the another. The second one, the second rule that I teach to my, to my pupils in the university is that the litigation lawyers, um, we are um, like doctors. We have to press until it hurts. And that's really important that, and, and that is really important to explain to the companies because we have to collaborate, we have to explain with the, with the company, which is the, the real problem about the corporate compliance, about the, these crimes, about the, the, all the matters that could uh, appear in the company. Um, in this regard, the continental law, and by extension our Spanish legal system, have designed through the years several determining factors when facing a legal problem. The first one is the Spanish legal system is based on legality. This means that there are only laws, its codes and norms, the ones to define the extent of any court rulings and decisions. The second one is the justice can only be discharged fairly by judge, and only judge can apply his best criteria to give a ruling under the power of the law. In Spanish jurisprudence it is important, but not to obtain a concrete court decision unlikely the common law, where previous decisions by the judge are fully enforceable to get a result in the same directions as those previous court rulings. The judge, or examining the magistrate, conducts the investigation. The trial lawyer is the one leading defense strategy, and the public prosecutor is there to perform a formal accusation. These roles are predetermined by law, and consequently, as lawyers are to take an important role in the play. This is the most important thing that I used to, to teach to my students, and this is really important. And finally, the prevention programs are the key of the strategy defense. But they are alone, not the only factor to take into consideration when determining the latter. We must be open to get an agreement point to meet half away between our pretensions and those of public prosecutor. Let's not to forget that wise quote regarding a Spanish law. And it's always better a bad agreement than a good trial. This is really important because we have to make a perfect um, conversation with the prosecutor, with the judge, with all the parts in this kind of of uh, crimes um, that I would like to explain briefly in these minutes that our host has kindly given me as a really not how the law works technically regarding corporate compliance but what to expect in Spain regarding that the proceeding is the most practical way I very I'm very happy about one question that is really important. Uh, there's so much corruption in Spain, but there's one a really good news that I think that is important to say. It's about the Spanish Justice, Dep Justice Department and, of course, the Police Department, all the, all the departments that we work uh, against the corruptions are very efficient. Why I told you this? Because uh, we know that, uh, for example, in The Economist, the, the newspaper Economist uh, told that the Spanish, uh, that the, in the Spanish, and then in Spain, sorry, in Spain there's so much corruption. But um, I think that we are uh, 
going to find, and we found the, the perfect way just to fight the, this corruption. Um, the lawyers, the litigation lawyers, the corporate lawyers, we have the responsibility just to fight against the corruption. As you may have already experienced, we are currently under a kind of theoretical corporate compliance fever that has led us to believe that there is no effective way to comply with it. As a lawyers, we have been to collaborate with companies creating a synergy where it has been easier to build barriers and firewalls to protect them from the most common felonies and crimes committed by the proper corporations and its employees it we have be held. The Spanish legal system has evolved over the years to become among the democratic countries one of the strongest anti-corruption regulation, not only at public level, but also relating to business to business and individual to individual relations. In fact, no so long, as you could know, uh, it was beyond our wildest dream to think about an ex-minister ex and ex-IMF president to be accused for a private corruption crimes. And that's why the Spanish lawmakers, through the Organic Law 5 2010, regulate for the first time the crime of the corruption within individuals in the Spanish Criminal Code. The new regulation incriminates different cases of corruption in private activities, and this work defends a pure model of incrimination of the competence trying to delimitate if other related offenses. In this sense, we got it, the Organic Law 5 2010, modified the Spanish Criminal Code, complies with the framework decisions, adding a new article regarding private corruptions between individuals as a culmination of the extensive concept of corruption defined in the Spanish Criminal Code. Traditional corruption has been tied to the public sector as a frame and civil servants, public employees as active subjects. A first steps towards these final conceptions were the Organic Law 3-2000 and 15-2003 incorporate into our criminal code a new kind of felony that of those foreign public employees and international commerce transactions following OECD guidelines. In the memorandum of the organic law, it is stated of the following. The key idea behind this subject is that fair competition must be guaranteed through the punishment of those behaviors geared to corrupt managing directors of a company same as it's in no days being done with public servants and the crime of bribery. And it's as up those conducts be exceeding the private area and the ones breaking the fair market rules. Fair and loyal competition is the key justification to extend the concept of corruption to the private sector along with the public one, since it helps and prevents sustained economic growth in this sense, even if, if there is, is no economic harm specific to the victim, private corruption damages the whole of, so, of society. There are some scandals that have helped to shape this new conception of private, especially in the final markets. Starting uh, big international companies such as en Enron, Arthur Anderson in USA, Ericsson, uh, European Union, uh, International Organization, uh, Olympic Committee, or for example, in uh, the uh, International Football Association, uh, like uh, we heard a um, few weeks ago. In this sense, from the moment that corruption becomes a global problem, a globalized world and the anti-corruption strategy becomes global as well. In 1997, the OECD treaty market a turning point in the conception that bribery from private companies to public employees was a felony and not a deduct deductible expense and it was considered before and shocking even an important part of its good governance practice. In addition, the massive privatizations that 
have taken a place in the last decades uh, had as a result an equally massive transfer of the economic resources to private hands resources that were that were before under public control. That's why private, private sector regulations must be redefined at least more accurate to real life situations. International vehicles and assets are not symbolic anymore. In this case, in Spain, talking about the private corruption, talking about the corruption in general, we got in a special court that uh, I think that, that, that you know, I, I don't know if we are talking about Audiencia Nacional or something like this. No. Okay. We, we, yeah. We got it in a special court called the Audiencia Nacional. And it's a special court because it's focused, for example, in this case about corruption. And it's really important because uh, in that case, and, uh, for example, Mr. Jose Maria could told to us that there's a long, no more than 20 firms or 20 kind of lawyers who work in this special court. And this is really important because there is a really different way of thinking about law, about the crimes, about the corporate compliance, for example, than the other kind of courts. And it's really important because we have to make a really good relationship with the prosecutors and the other parts of the proceed. Why I told you this? Because um, we don't get it right now in the Spanish uh, uh, system, we don't get it in a special case of corruption, uh, for example, in this case of individual uh, crimes in the, in the in this, in this kind of, of, uh, of crimes. We don't get it at uh, uh, the final resolution. We don't get it uh, jurisprudence about this. And it's really important that we meet between the litigation lawyers and the corporate lawyers. We're going to make uh, the best way to find the good solutions for the company. I would like to tell you that that um, matter is easier than, than the theory, but it's not true. The practice is really, really, really difficult. And right now we get it, I think, so that there's only two or three uh, big and um, important cases in the Audiencia Nacional who's talking about the, this kind of corruption. And maybe in a few years we'll get it the the jurisprudence and we'll get the resolutions uh, who show us which is the, the way and which is the, the proper way that we got it in, in this case of corruption uh, crimes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ignacio. Now, Carlos, is your turn. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Um, first of all, thank you to the organizers, the anti fraud office. Um, it's an honor to be here uh, in such a distinct European forum. Um, I must begin by congratulating the um, Estonian government, the Ministry of Justice, because um, they have uh, taken upon themselves such a difficult task and such an important task, and therefore my congratulations also go to the other authorities that seem to be following up on what uh, the Ministry of Justice in Estonia is doing. So. Um, because I was called on short notice, I, um, I do not have a PPP, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I will play the old school professor, you know, with um, just uh, giving my advice on certain issues. But I can happily deliver a paper upon request uh, after the, 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 well, this meeting. Okay, so I will focus on, on the title because it's quite interesting, the title of this seminar. Um, reducing corruption, focusing on private sector corruption, and actually there's a, a very notable specification, criminal liability of legal persons and, and compliance programs. In my 10 to 15 minutes presentation, I will try to put everything together and finish up with some basic three recommendations that I, this is always quite handy, right, when, when you're trying to achieve things. And uh, then I think that the most important issue here is to be able to discuss, right, with your questions and answers after, after the presentation. So, um, first of all, um, private corruption um, has always been 
uh, at least for the last 12 years, right, on the EU agenda. I guess that all of you are aware of the framework decision of 2003, right, in which you have the two basic points that we are trying to focus on today. Uh, in the preamble, it says explicitly uh, that the countries have to ensure that both active and passive corruption are criminal offenses, and second, that legal persons may also be held responsible for such offenses. Um, so you have the two things, right? Sanctioning, right? Hmm? You have corporate criminal liability. I, mean, I will say corporate criminal liability because it's you know, most known as such around the world. Criminal liability of legal entities is something very European, but you know, around the world we talk about corporate criminal liability. And um, uh, then you have something missing, right? It's, uh, do you see the word compliance programs in the 2003 framework decision? No. I will get back to that in, uh, in the end because it's something that I would strongly recommend if there is any type of initiative in this uh, sort of direction. So, um, regarding the 2003 framework decision, you are all aware that member states have been dragging their feet, right? Um, Actually, there have been two reports on the implementation of this framework decision. Um, Spain, I'm sorry, did not submit any data for both reports. The last one is in 2011. And uh, by 2009, only nine member states had implemented the framework decision. So uh, I guess it's, it's not like a very popular framework decision in the EU. So how, how to change this, right? How, how to go somewhere else? So um, these are all, sorry, uh, uh, statistics from the report from the commission of June 6, 2011. Yeah? So um, when dealing as a, a, a criminal defense attorney, also a compliance attorney in corporations, you always see that multinational corporations, or at least corporations that have some you know, branches uh, somewhere else in, in some other countries, they normally have a so-called anti-corruption compliance program. Yeah? You, you, you regularly see that. However, where, where, where is the problem? The problem is that you may see that there is a uh, notable difference between how they treat public officials and how they treat corporate officers, private. Um, most of the time they say, okay, no gifts to public officials, no way. Uh, invitations, no public officials. They always have that very much in their mind. You see that in the uh, training, in the policies. Um, they say, oh, you would never pick up a phone and, and, and call the public official at the Minister of uh, Public Procurement huh, to request an audience so that you can explain much better the tender offer, right? But when you do that with corporate officers, they're like, oh, yeah, of course. We invite them to football, and we buy them things. And, uh, of course, we call and to see, you know, a follow-up on the program. So you see two different standards. You see two different standards. My take on this, why is this? Uh, because the most important instrument probably in the world is the FCPA, I guess that all of you are aware of, uh, the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, the American legislation that applies extraterritorially, yeah? And the, FC, the USA FCPA is only designed for public officials. So multinational companies, when they start implementing compliance programs, they're always thinking about public officials, public officials because they have the FCPA in mind. Yeah? And most international companies that have any type of dealings with the U.S. will have an FCPA compliance program. But in that, that FCPA compliance program, there will be absolutely no provision regarding private corruption. Absolutely none. So um, this is a tendency that we should change we, uh, to the extent of our possibilities. We should change uh, to a certain extent. Um, there was a study conducted in 2012 by uh, Stuart Green, one of the really renowned professors in the U.S., and uh, they submitted different questions. You know, it was the same example to different companies, right? And it was with public official or with corporate officers. And the response was, oh, yeah, this is a crime. Oh, no, that, that's not a crime. 
And the survey was humongous. I mean, it was really big. And uh, so you have academic data that backs up this difference, you know, of perception in corporations. And actually, my personal experience in different corporations, I can tell you that there is this dual perception about the seriousness of um, this type of uh, private and, and public corruption. Okay. Now, let's turn to what legislators think. Um, I think that we can all agree that most legislators would say that public and private corruption are equally gross or reprehensible or blameworthy. it, yeah? Um, both of them, they affect fair competition. What we do not want is companies buying goods and services from other companies based on the bribe that they're getting, the kickback that they're getting, but not on the quality of the services or products that they're obtaining, right? And that holds the same for public and private corruption. Um, I, I can develop on this. I, I, I don't want to take too much of my time with this, but uh, in the U.S., uh, the USA, you can see that um, you have federal laws that technically they are in a way handling public and private corruption to the same extent. Um, federally, you have the, um, the Travel Act that is related to any type of um, private, it's called private commercial bribery, private commercial bribery in state law. So if for a private commercial bribery offense according to a state law. You use any type of device that is considered to be federal, that is emails, phone calls, almost anything can be federal in the U.S., then automatically that is a travel act offense, right? You have over 30 states in the United States that criminalize private commercial bribery, yeah? So, According to legislators, that, that, that should be the same, right? I mean, it's equally reprehensible, it's equally serious, yeah? Uh, in the EU, you have exactly the same attitude. You have the framework decision of, of 2003, and you have also, you know, the directive on the protection of the financial interests of the EU, that is it's a proposal, right? But that is specifically targets corruption, right? That is public corruption. So you, that you would see that the EU has the same stance on private and, and public corruption. And uh, actually, the UK Bribery Act, that's one of the key features, applies to also private and not only public corruption. Um, let me tell you a, a very short story. While um, Alan Casanovas and I were at an ISO, actually it was the first meeting of the anti-bribery management system, the ISO 30, 37-1. Um, one of the first issues that was discussed was the scope of the standard. Hmm? Some countries said, oh, no, 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 this standard, it's only for public corruption. And the chairman, I don't know if you remember, Alan, and the chairman was quite adamant about saying, no, 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 this must be also for private corruption because it is exactly the same issue. Hmm? So um, the good thing about this ISO standard uh, is that it, will, it, it applies to both. Uh, it doesn't make such a huge difference about if it's a public official or not. The important thing is that it's a decision maker in the company be it a, a local government or a private company at which, you know, you may obtain goods and services. So, um, in a nutshell, just summing up uh, everything I've said and just uh, recommending future action. First, um, um, we have to equal the standards between private and public corruption. If any type of action is taken by the uh, Minister of Justice of Lithuania or whatever, uh, of Estonia, sorry, uh, it has to be on equal standards, huh? not differentiating between one or the other. Hmm? If you say you cannot make uh, gifts to public officials, you cannot make gifts to corporate officers, okay? Um, that, of course, begs the question if all type of measures are uh, effective against corruption, but if 
you are going to do something, please do it on equal standards. Second, and this is quite important, um, in legislation concerning private corruption, always introduce a defense for corporations on the basis of, of their compliance programs. Let me develop two minutes on that. The way the 2003 Directive Framework, uh, sorry, Framework Decision is right now, it says, okay, the corporation will be held liable if a agent, agent of the corporation, uh, you know, commits this uh, to the benefit of the corporation, okay? But there is not a specific defense saying, however, the corporation will not be held responsible if it has in place a, an effective compliance program, yeah? If you really want corporations to engage in having effective compliance programs, you have to give them a carrot, yeah? Carrot and sticks. Carrot. If you have a, an effective compliance program, you are not going to be liable. Stick. If you don't have it, you are really going to be liable. But precisely because you do not have uh, that very clear message, a lot of corporations are saying, you know, why should I have this? You know, in the end, it's not going to play a role. You know? Actually, we just had here in Spain a very important reform because corporate criminal liability in 2010 considered compliance programs only as mitigating factors. That is, they did not exclude liability. It was only a mitigating factor. Now, in 2015, the legislature um, said, well, because of different interpretations, I want to make this clear. It excludes liability. The reaction, an incredible increase in corporations adopting compliance programs. I mean, it was good for the business of the compliance lawyers, I can tell you that, because it has been an incredible increase because now they feel safe that they know how to play by the rules. Yeah? If I have this, an effective compliance program, I will do that. So, third recommendation, and with this I try to come to an end. Um, incentivize the use of certified compliance programs. Uh, how you can do that? Huh? The ISO 30, uh, 37001, uh, 37001 um, it was precisely produced because there was an out outcry, there was a call by the private sector saying we need to have a standard so that when we talk to each other or we talk to the government, we know what we're talking about. Hmm? This is the standard of compliance programs because if not, anybody can say, oh, I have a great compliance program, yeah? How can you check? Hmm? This is why the 37,001 uh, um, is a certifiable compliance program. And how you can use that, two ways. First, in public procurement, you can request, yeah? You can request from the potential contractors as a requisite, as a circumstance that they have to credit, that they have a compliance program, yeah? So the law would be, uh, in case any company wants to be a contractor of the Estonian government, they must have a certified compliance program like a lot of times you request an ISO 9001 quality management system certified program. I'm, I'm not sure you're very aware of, of how this works, but in a lot of countries and in a lot of companies, they request an ISO standard of quality management in order to contract with that company. This will be exactly the same. You make it in the law, you need a certified compliance, anti-corruption compliance program. Okay, second, Forcing the private companies to do that would be quite a gap, right? I mean, the companies would say, hey, you cannot force us, you know, uh, how we have to contract with other companies. That is true. I mean, that would be too much state intervention, right? You know, say, setting the standards for private companies. However, you can incentivize that. There is a lot of um, soft law standards by various different private sectors that, you know, with time, they start making certain requirements for people belonging to those sectors. 
For instance, in the pharma industry, pharmaceutical industry, more and more compliance programs are required to be. And not because we have a law saying you need compliance programs, but because they have been aware of the benefits that this brings to them. So um, a lot of, I believe, explanation has to be done and, you know, maybe some uh, tax incentives for uh, companies that do have this certified compliance programs. I mean, there are ways in which the government can incentivize, not only impose, right, uh, certain actions that they feel adequate, and really this, this can play a, a, a key factor because the more companies start using between them uh, certified compliance programs saying, hey, I, I want to contract with you. I mean, one of the requirements for me contracting with you is that you have a certified compliance program. The more that happens, the less corruption, private corruption, you are going to have. Um, thank you so much for, much, uh, for your time. Well, thank you very much, Carlos. And are there any questions? Well, while um, they're thinking about their questions, maybe, maybe uh, an, an, an interesting idea, also thinking in, in litigation lawyers too, is would be how we are, you've been talking about the, the, um, the defense element of the existence of this uh, uh, compliance program, but uh, maybe if we could go to the other side and say how close or how far away w w would we be from seeing an, an aggravation on the, uh, on the officer of a company that would incur in a corrupt practice despite the fact circumventing a, a compliance program. Would, are we close or are we far away from seeing this as an aggravating uh, circumstance for that individual? Um, in my opinion, we, we are quite far from that. <laughs> I mean, um, and, and, and it should be, it is, it is not an aggravating circumstance in almost no legislation, I mean, compared worldwide. Um, what was interesting is, and, and related to that, uh, in, in this reform that was in 2015, in the proposal, there was a very, very interesting article provision. It said, the officers of a company that do not implement a compliance program will be criminally responsible for not implementing a compliance program. It was a very incredible provision because it make it a crime, personal liability, you go to jail, yeah, for the officers not to have a compliance program, even if no crime was committed. No, it, it, that was, really something quite scary for a lot of companies, you know. Uh, it was quite good for corporate lawyers because we were all saying, hey, any company is going to have a compliance program if we pass this legislation. But it was kind of scary. Um, what is the standard worldwide regarding, I think this is a little bit the, 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 the point that you were trying to make. Um, in an, the international standard is the following. If a company does not have a compliance program and the company suffers the imposition of a fine, criminal penalty, right, that could have been reduced, mitigated, or even excluded by a compliance program, the shareholders of the company, yeah, can file a complaint against the CEO or the CFO, yeah, claiming damages. I don't, I don't know if you, if you follow me. They say, okay, the company had to pay one million euros, dollars, yeah? one million euros, yeah? If we would have had a compliance program, we would only have paid 100,000 euros, yeah? The difference, CEO, you pay that, yeah? We, as shareholders of the company, do not have to pay that because it was your responsibility to have in place an effective compliance program, and because you did not have the effective compliance program, we had to pay. The company had to pay. Yeah? This case, the landmark case for this is called Kermark 
1996 in, the, in, in Delaware. Um, and based on Caremark and you know, shareholders being active against CEOs not implementing compliance programs, a lot of companies incorporated in Delaware, and I believe that all of you know that Delaware you know, is a most preferred states by companies to get incorporated, uh, a lot of companies, almost all companies in Delaware, they started having compliance programs because the CEOs were afraid that shareholders would file a complaint against them because of you know, the, the, the sanction that, that they, they had to pay as a company because of not having a, a compliance program. Yes, I would like to add mm -hmm. to the words of my friend Carlos that there is not, not only, let's say, a U.S. issue we had in, in Europe. Uh, we already had uh, similar judgments in, in Europe, in particular in Italy. We have judgments starting from 2008 stating the liability of uh, officers, directors of a company for not implementing a compliance system. And are the shareholders the ones to claim uh, to, these, to these persons? So it is not, a, I, I mean, the precedents maybe are in the U.S., but it's not a U.S. issue. I would say that this is a worldwide issue and happens, already happens in, in, in Europe as well. Yeah, yeah for, for the litigation lawyer, this is the, the best news that we got it because <laughs> we, we got it, the best instrument uh, for the proceeding in the court. This is, this is basic in, in our, in our uh, work. Uh, just to have a really good instrument of the corporate compliance implementing the company, and we can use in the court, for example, uh, if we got it a, a crime and the proceed open. It's really, really, really important. So, any questions? Any further questions? Or maybe, well, maybe um, uh, this, this, this different perception from these different standards and different perception from private and public corruption um, made it uh, has any impact also in the in the in the in the forensic in the legal practice in before courts that um, these different standards that permeates maybe in this in this in these inquiries in this um, in these reports made about how different is perceived the the same practice the same payment whether who receives it is a public or a private uh, individual um, Permeates also the court decisions. It is harder to get a court decision in a private in a private corruption case than it would be if it was a public corruption case. Um, yeah, I mean, here's an advice for law enforcement agents that I've seen around here. Um, 2010. Yeah, we have the first statutes here in Spain, the first provisions on private corruption. Yeah. Before 2010, December 2010, we had no statutes concerning pub, uh, private corruption. Yeah? 2010, 2015, not a single big case, right? The perception in the companies was not, you know, very acute, right? However, 2015, we have a case that I can tell it publicly because it's a public um, knowledge, um, the case against the former director of the IMF, yeah, IMF, the International Monetary Fund, yeah, the former director is, is a Spaniard, and there was the first big case against him on private corruption charges. Incredible. All companies started saying, oh my God, if they're doing this against the former director of the IMF, I better start thinking about this. And actually, uh, that same court has initiated three more private corruption proceedings against other people, not in this case, you know. I'm involved in, in two of them. And you see that the one case that hits the media, yeah, the newspapers, the, you know, yeah, the media frenzy, you know, people talking about it, that's the case that gets everything going. So if you are law enforcement agents, I would recommend making one case, but really one strong case, right? And that one strong case, good media, and you are going to get all the companies thinking about this problem. 
Yes, I would like, I would like to add that uh, regarding the Spanish regulation, you know, that as mentioned, uh, the criminal liability of legal entities in Spain was introduced in 2010, but what happens here is that it's not applicable to uh, public entities. It's not applicable to, to the state, to the public entities. Why? Because at the end, if there is a sanction or if there is a judgment imposing the dissolution of the entities and no sense, if there is a sanction, if there is a penalty, it depends on that at the end of the day, pay all the taxpayers. We all pay this penalty through our taxes, so it's no sense. So because of that, there is a big difference in internal risk controls uh, mechanisms in public and private sector. I made a comparison of, of that, and normally in the public sector, there are exposed mechanisms of control. But in these standards we are talking about, the Asia standards, the most relevant control uh, mechanisms refers to ongoing mechanisms. That is to say, to have someone day by day controlling activities from a compliance and a risk point, point of view perspective. In the public sector, it's not exactly the same, and only with a few exceptions, you have these sorts of internal organisms taking care of the internal control and taking care of compliance. And uh, this was my point that the difference, at least in Spain, because the regulation is that uh, compliance management systems in the public sector are not common because the public sector is not obliged to have it, let's say, and the institutions in the public sector, let's say, uh, are not aligned with the most recent and relevant standards in compliance in terms of having ongoing management systems in the related transactions. The, the Rado case shows that, uh, that in Spanish we carry the strongest, or maybe <laughs> the strongest anti-corruption regulations. And of course, uh, the Justice Department is, is working without thinking about if there's a, a politic or if there's a, 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 public, a public person or individual person. Uh, I think that uh, this case uh, makes a difference between the another kind of cases in corruptions and, and the corruptions understand it nowadays. This is really important and we are very expected, all the lawyers, about, the, about this case because it's, it's uh, the innovation about uh, criminal law and about the corporate compliance and in this case about this kind of crime. It's really important and I think that uh, maybe in the next year if there's another session of this kind of, of meeting, we could talk more about this case, and this is really, really, really interesting. So, any questions now? Okay. Yes. Um, uh, my question is that, in your opinion, how effective of a measure is, um, is activities uh, to uh, raise awareness among uh, entrepreneurs about uh, private corruption. I mean, uh, media campaigns, um, uh, public events. Uh, do you think is it is it an effective measure? I think so. I fully agree with you in the sense that these standards I was talking about these standards has a lot to do with the corporate culture. It is to generate a compliance culture in organisations. And the, the, one of the most effective ways to achieve this goal is through awareness and training. So uh, these standards make stress a lot the relevance of training and awareness as a way of achieve this cultural uh, issue in, in companies. So fully agree with you, it's 100% important. And uh, a lot of companies are carrying out training programs and awareness programs. The difference between training and awareness is that training is risk-based approach. I mean, you have to focus the training, but the training on the focus of risks, on the persons who can put you in a risk. And the awareness is for everyone in the organization. So you, have, you can have in place uh, awareness campaigns for everybody, and it is always, always good. So fully agree with this. It's neat. Um, I think it's a great idea. Uh, but probably if you ask the companies uh, what they do prefer, talking about, you know, the awareness of the fight against corruption or getting a tax cut, you know, deduction at the end of the year, probably they will say, 
oh, if I'm getting a tax cut, I'm sure I'm going to have an effective compliance program in place. So um, the, the problem with the uh, perception about corruption is that um, when it becomes systemic, and that's what, something that has been said before, when it becomes systemic and everyone does it, yeah, you get the problem of the so-called pay to play, you know? You have to start corrupting just to be able to play the game and to have any type of contracts. So if you start saying, well, this is really bad and this is bad for our business, bad for competition, they say, yeah, 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 but I need to have some type of business, you know? And when it's systemic, anytime you want to have business, you have to pay. How to revert the situation, you know, with carrots and sticks, you know? If you have carrots, tax cuts, um, there are other ways, you know, of funding by the federal government, uh, by the Estonian government or whatever, right? And at the same time, enforcement actions, you know, one, two, three enforcement actions, but highly, uh, highly media frenzy, you know, actions that are really aware, you know, make people aware of the consequences of not having those compliance programs. Uh, I think that that combination, um, probably is a little bit more effective than, you know, public meetings, although public meetings and that sort of, uh, you know, distribution of knowledge of why this is important to corporations is also um, quite necessary, yeah? But um, uh, think about the other one too, you know, the carrots and sticks. And the key thing is, <coughs> sorry, the key thing maybe is make it see that it's not a cost, but it's an investment maybe. Yes. So, any any other questions? I would like to know what do you think about the whistleblower? If you think that in Spain, in a private or public case of corruption, the whistleblower is protected enough, or maybe the whistleblower is an issue that depends on the culture of the country. Of course, to have a, a whistleblowing line is always welcome. I think it's something which is within these standards I was talking about. And uh, of course, if you have a, a complete and a robust compliance management system, one of the requirements of the system is to warranty no actions against the whistleblower. Then let's say no, no actions against the whistleblower. No actions against, against the good faith whistleblowers, which is different, which is different. And so if you have a robust compliance system, in principle, whistleblower uh, can, can uh, make the, the, their point and communicate their, his point and, and no problem. In, in Spain, every day there is more companies with this type of measures because we in KPMG have studied the deficiency and let's say it is not a costly measure because it's very easy to have a whistleblowing line nowadays. And the, the, the effectiveness of the system of the control is very, very high in comparison with, with the cost. So every day there is more companies with a whistleblowing, with a whistleblowing line. I have to confess that from a cultural point of view, there are some countries that they are more reluctant to have, let's say some countries in terms of some uh, subsidiaries of a uh, given country that are reluctant to have a, a whistleblowing line. But I think that uh, every day is, most, is, 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 is more a, a must than a, a luxury to have it. Um, the whistleblowing question in Spain is, is, is quite um, interesting and many of you maybe are not that aware um, of, of, of this. Um, most whistleblowing procedures require anonymity, yeah? That you don't know who is doing the complaint, yeah? who is blowing the whistle, yeah? However, in Spain, uh, we have a data protection agency that thinks otherwise. They establish that whistleblowing procedures or systems must be confidential, not anonymous, but confidential, yeah? These that, uh, this really does not meet the EU standard. You know, the EU standard from the European Data Protection Agency is that they can very well be anonymous. 
In Spain, we say they have to be confidential. They cannot be anonymous. Yeah, that's what the Spanish Data Protection Agency says. Right. Why does it have an impact in what you're saying? Because people, yeah, whistleblowers, when they type they, their name, they don't feel secure. They don't feel protected. Even though the company says, oh, but your information is going to be confidential. Yeah, right. You know, if I'm filing a complaint against the CEO, I bet you that tomorrow I'm going to be out the door. Yeah? So um, most systems around the world require, and actually the, the ISO standard is anonymous. Yeah? So that they don't have to type in their name or any type of information that have to relate the person to the facts. Yeah? This, a lot of times, generates a problem for the compliance officer, yeah? Because it receives a lot of, you know, complaints from the whistleblowing system, and he has to discriminate a lot. Okay, well, it's part of your job, yeah? But it's important to have so-called non-retaliation policies inside the compliance program. First, of course, you're not gonna fire the person. Second, the whistleblowing system is anonymous. Um, international standards, such as the Dodd-Frank Act in the, in the US, the 2010, established that it's absolutely mandatory that it's anonymous and that the companies have a non-retaliation policy. Actually, it goes even further. It enables yeah, the employees of the corporation to file the complaints directly with the SEC. They has generated a lot of skepticism because said, hey, hey, this is something that we have to take care inside the corporation. This is not to get it from the get-go outside the corporation, right? But in order to foster, to incentivize the whistleblowing procedures, um, in the U.S., the Dodd-Frank enabled, you know, a whistleblowing system directly to the, to the SEC. I think that is a little bit too much, but certainly non-retaliation policies and anonymity. Yeah? And Spain has to upgrade. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so then I'll summarize only briefly this, what, what this, the panelists has, has been men, have been mentioning, you know. Uh, Alain Casanovas has, has put the stress in the difference between requirement and commitment in the adopting the standards. Um, and the big problem that represents for the company is the, duplic the duplication of procedures and lack of uh, coordination between compliance systems. Uh, we're moving from the absence of compliance programs to the excess, maybe, of compliance programs. Uh, Ignacio Fuste Fabra has put this stress on the litigation that it's not a, an exact science and has stressed the, the, the uh, prevention as a key in a defense strategy and, and the, the efficiency uh, of the Spanish law enforcement agencies and the evolution of the, of the, um, of the Spanish legislation whilst Carlos has, has put um, this stress also in the different standards between public officers and private employees, and as has um, 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 indicated, has identified maybe the origin of these different standards in how this private and public corruption is dealt in companies in the FCPA, and um, these recommendations that have uh, that have uh, had uh, also this um, uh, in, in his experience about the um, existence of the certified, the promotion of certified programs and uh, enabling that the compliance program will be a defense in a, in a case. So thank you very much for all. And now we have uh, a coffee break. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Just